Hi, I'm Deborah Bird. You're watching Earth Skies, Sun News of the Week. Um, I'm usually here with our friend C. Alex Young, who is a heliophysicist or sun scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and he's the co-author of our daily sun post at earthsky.org. But he can't be with us today because he's at the American Geophysical Union meeting in Washington, D.C., and that's a gathering of some 26,000 Earth and space scientists. But I did catch up to Alex earlier today to talk about what's going on at the meeting. And first, we talked about Parker Solar Probe, which will come closer to the sun than any spacecraft ever on December 24th. Okay, so Parker Solar Probe is a mission that was actually conceived of in 1958, shortly after Eugene Parker predicted the existence of the solar wind and at the very beginning of the space age, which is the exact same time that, that um, Van Allen discovered the radiation belts. Uh, so it's been in development for all that time. Uh, because it is technologically a very difficult thing to get to the sun, believe it or not. Um, it's very far away. It's an extremely hazardous environment. Um, and so what we have now seen is the spacecraft was launched in August 2018, and it has now taken uh, 23 flybys of the sun, um, and seven of seven flybys of Venus to use Venus to help it slow down so that it can get closer and closer to the sun. And uh, it has now flown through the sun's outer uh, uh, tenuous atmosphere called the corona, the part of the sun's atmosphere that you can actually see during a total solar eclipse. Um, and it each, each one of these Venus flybys, it then gets a little bit closer to the sun. And on the 24th, it will make its closest approach. It will be less than 3.9 million miles from the surface of the sun, the part we call the photosphere, where all the visible light comes from. And, and that may not sound too close for people, but you just have to think about it in terms of the fact that the sun is actually 93 million miles away. So... That's actually uh, incredibly close. And this spacecraft is designed to handle the intense heat from the sun, to handle the very harsh radiation environment. And it has already made uh, amazing discoveries about the solar wind, about various aspects of space weather. And we are all at NASA and our partners, for example, uh, APL, the uh, Applied Physics Lab, Johns Hopkins, we are all just thrilled. I mean, this is such a monumental event. It has already broken the records, but it will be the fastest human-made object ever, traveling more than 450,000 miles per hour. And to put that in some context, Traveling at that speed, you could go from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia in one second. Um, so that's that's the mission, and, and it will continue on after that. Um, but we are we are just, you know, it's it is basically like being a kid in a candy store that this is this is really happening in our lifetime. Wow. Okay. So that's Parker Solar Probe, and it's coming closer to the sun than any spacecraft ever. So the scientists that are at the American Geophysical Union meeting this week are talking about that, and that is super exciting. It's going to come within 3.9 million miles of the sun's surface, and that's just a tiny fraction of the Earth-Sun distance. So it's really, really close to the sun on Christmas Eve, December 24th. But next, Alex and I talked about some more stuff. We talked about uh, just what heliophysicists or sun scientists are thinking about nowadays, like what's important to them, and that is space weather. Yeah, so as we've talked before, we're, we are in the period called solar maximum. So there's a lot of excitement 
about all of the activity that we've been seeing. How does this solar cycle compare to other ones? Um, a lot of focus on space weather. Space weather is very much in the spotlight, not just uh, within NASA, but at a at a federal and a global level. I and mean, there are specific legislation and specific executive filings as well as um, Senate filings about how po important space weather is. So it's it's now a national priority, which also means that NASA is here with a lot of our partners like NOAA, FEMA, um, and various other organizations to prepare, you know, to develop a new instrumentation. I know people have uh, probably seen, and uh, many weeks ago, we shared the first light from the new coronagraph that NOAA has launched, which is operational. That is, it's not just, it's not for science, it's specifically for monitoring space weather. Uh, so this is a, a meeting where all of the players internationally get together and talk about, you know, what are our plans? Right. So at this week's American Geophysical Union meeting, the sun scientists ha are talking about space weather. So space weather is uh, a big priority for them. And in case you're not sure, the term space weather is just describing events on the sun and the solar wind uh, that's in near Earth space and that strikes Earth's upper atmosphere. And so space weather is what causes those big displays of the northern lights or aurora borealis that many of you may have seen last May, or there was another one, a smaller one in October. Uh, but when a big storm happens on the sun, it can create conditions that affect power grids on Earth. It can cause them to crash. And if you're a regular viewer of the Earth Sky Sun News of the Week on Fridays, you know we sometimes speak with space weather forecaster Sean Dahl of NOAA. Uh, and he talks to us about the hotline that NOAA uses to communicate with U.S. power companies to warn them when a big space weather event is on the way. So according to Alex, that's been a big topic this week at the AGU meeting in Washington, where sun scientists are you know, talking about how to protect our power grids and how to protect people, basically how to protect society from storms on the sun. But there's more. So uh, Alex told me that these scientists who study the sun aren't just thinking about today. They're thinking about the future. So here's Alex again to tell us about that. Now, the other aspect, which is arguably the most important thing for our field, is actually something called the Decadal Survey. So. The National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Math, which is sort of the premier organization in the U.S. for, for science uh, and STEM, uh, one of the things they do for NASA is for each of the science organizations, they produce a 10-year report. Every 10 years, they report what has this particular group at NASA done and what should they be doing next with their science and what are the missions that they recommend, and how does that fit into the budget moving forward. And so heliophysics, my field, um, the National Academy's just released the current uh, decadal survey. Now this is an 800 page report, and I have to admit I have not got through it all yet, I'm working my way through it. Uh, I don't think I've ever read a book with 800 pages. And, and so this is the, most important document arguably for, for people in my field because it really, really maps out the future, not just the future for the scientists that are here now, but the future for the next generation of scientists. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the war and peace of sun science, the decadal survey in heliophysics, 800 pages long. And, uh, and, and, you know, I have an 11 year old grandson and I think about uh, in the next 10 years, you know, he's going to be growing up and, come, and going into some field. So maybe, who knows, maybe that, that will affect him in some way. And actually, I think it'll affect all of us because of what I was just, we were just talking about, which was uh, space weather.
So by the time the next decadal survey is is being put into action, maybe 10 years from now, uh, the sun is going to be at the peak of its solar cycle again, and we're going to be getting these big storms in the sun again. And so it just keeps going and going and going. Uh, but scientists in the AGU meeting this week are thinking about the future of their field in another way, too. Uh, and Alex used the phrase open science to describe that conversation. And so it stems from the fact that we have these new technologies today and there are huge amounts of data being amassed. We even have missions like SDO, which are still producing vast amounts of data. So how do we make that data available, not only to, to the NASA scientists, but everyone who wants it in the world. That includes the public, uh, citizen scientists. Um, and so what's the infrastructure for that? Um, because also related to that is what we call open science. I mean, one of the key things about science is when you do your science, your science should be reproducible by other people. That's a that's kind of a fundamental tenet of, of what science, the process of science is. But how do you do that if you don't know what data people used, if you don't know what analysis software they used um, in addition to their paper? And so this is a mandate from the, the top of the federal government that all agencies should be pushing towards open science. And not only should we be publishing our you know, results in a paper, but we should be publishing our data and our software. So that's one of the key things we've been doing at this meeting. Yeah, okay. And so, you know, that is Dr. C. Alex Young. He's speaking to us from the American Geophysical Union meeting going on this week in Washington. He's a heliophysicist or sun scientist. And he told me that it's not just sun science that's moving toward open science, but all sciences. And the idea is to make it possible for all people to have access, not just to the results of science, but also to the data and the analysis technique that made those results possible. So that's open science, and you're probably gonna be hearing more about that in the years to come. So that's all we've got for today. Alex could not be here because he's at that meeting, but I wanna extend my thanks to him for speaking with me about the meeting and all the cool things that are happening there. And I also wanna thank my producer, Jeremiah Guajardo, who helped me put together this stream today. We will be back on Monday speaking with Burkhard Militzer of the University of California, Berkeley, about recent evidence for oceans hiding below the surfaces of the planets Uranus and Neptune. Could they harbor life? Join us at our regular time, 12.15 p.m. Central or 18.15 UTC uh, on Monday for that discussion. One Earth, one sky, Earth sky.